If you can stand for the reading of our text, Numbers chapter 9, verses 15 through 23. On the day that the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the testimony. And at evening it was over the tabernacle like the appearance of fire until morning. So it was always, the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night. And whenever the cloud lifted from over the tent, after the people of Israel set out, and in the place where the cloud settled down, there the people of Israel camped. At the command of the Lord, the people of Israel set out, and at the command of the Lord, they camped. As long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. Even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle, many days the people of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was a few days over the tabernacle, and according to the command of the Lord, they remained in the camp. Then according to the command of the Lord, they set out. And sometimes the cloud remained from evening until morning. And when the cloud lifted in the morning, they set out. Or if it continued for a day and a night, when the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether it was two days or a month or longer time, that the cloud continued over the tabernacle. Abiding there, the people of Israel remained in the camp and did not set out. But when it lifted, they set out. At the command of the Lord, they camped. And at the command of the Lord, they set out. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by Moses. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The, the last few chapters in the book of Numbers that we have looked at kind of <coughs> are like a, a checklist to be moving. Now, Dick and Connie are moving, and Connie told us Thursday that all she, like she stays awake at night getting everything ready, right? And I, I mean, I really have no inclination or desire ever to move. I've got so much junk Okay, But what we see in these last few chapters is, is not a checklist of logistics. Like, okay, I'm going to pack this box up or that box and it's going to go in that room and that. But rather, <coughs> it is a list um, of the presence and the support that God has promised and provided for his people. You know, there's several occasions. Abraham, who's the father of all faithful, but the father of the Israelites, God came to him in the Ur of Chaldees and said what? Go. But you know what God didn't tell him? God didn't tell him where. And here, the Israelites, God says, you're going to go and you're going to just trust me. And what we have seen in the past, we looked at last week at the, at the uh, Passover. The Passover was, <clears throat> you look back to do what? Why do you look back to the Passover? So you can look forward. That's how we progress as believers. We look back to the demonstrable faithfulness of God in the past so that we can walk in the future with all of its uncertainties. And what we find here is that God is listing and, and setting this, this checklist because they're about to embark in a wilderness. There are no Walmarts. There are no Casey's. There are no highways. There are no gas stations. You're going out there with all sorts of dangers and risks ahead of you, and you don't know where they lie. And so what God is doing is preparing them ahead of time for them to take off. And there's two things that he, has, that he is going to discuss before they take off. The first is the cloud of the tabernacle, which we just read this morning. And the next week, the Lord willing, the silver trumpets. They're going to depart in chapter 10. But before that, he wants to bring to mind the reality of things. And the subtitle of this lesson is Led by and for His Glory. There's three questions that I want to kind of look at and, and consider. The first, what, what in the world was this cloud? What was it? The second, what was its purpose? And the third is, what are we to take away from this text? Because remember, all this is not just simply there for us to be informed from history and think about things and go on. This was all written for our instructions and our patience so that as we travel through the wilderness God has before us as we're going home, how do we do it? 
and, and Scripture is given for our instruction and admonition. So let's look at these three questions one at a time. What was the cloud and why was it so central? This was not some natural phenomena. It was not an astronaut or atmospheric event. Rather, this was a supernatural, very obvious, unmistakable demonstration of God. There are people who want to argue that the liberals saying, well, there were this, this was just the cloud that came from all the uh, sacrifices that were offered. No. This was nothing natural. This was nothing ordinary. This wasn't something that you'd ever seen before. This was something that was extremely unique. Secondly, the cloud played a central role in the nation. It was not something of passing importance. Rather, the cloud was permanent and prominent. Okay, you remember, you're an Israelite, you're in the camp, you wake up in the morning, you go outside your tent, which was pitched in what direction? The door, the flaps of your tent were pitched toward what? The tabernacle. Now, if you happen to be one of the tribes on the outside, you have a whole bunch of uh, tents you might not even see the tabernacle. You know that? There was two and a half million people. I mean, that's a lot of folks. All right? You might not see the temple, uh, the tabernacle, but you'd wake out and you'd, you'd rub the sleepers out of your eyes and there would be one thing that you could not miss. What was it? This cloud, boom! This obvious cloud that was there and it was at the center. It was, in many sense, the defining reality. It was at the center of the camp, both physically, logistically, and theologically. It had a breathtaking experience, appearance. The principal description we read here ten times is called the cloud. And you find it several times referred to that. And so you look at a cloud and, and essentially, you know, you, you've got to use your imagination. But there is something, it, it has that, that consistency of a cloud. It is opaque it is it probably it's, it's clearly contrasting to the, the the sky around it hovers over the tabernacle until it's time to move then it lifts up at night what is it now if you read it and compare it what seems to be the case how many of you have ever seen the full moon during the daytime okay it's hard to see right okay why now have, have the same full moon at night, and what's true? It's very bright. In fact, it will cast shadows. What's the difference? What's the difference between a full moon during the day and a full moon at night? Sunshine. The sunshine has a tendency to what? Obscure the, the light of the moon, right? Now, I think what it is is that this cloud had this fire inside of it that was not seen clearly until the sun set. And so when the sun was setting, what did you begin to see? How many of you ever looked out and you see, especially in a horrible thunderstorm, you see lightning, but you don't see the bolt of lightning, you see the clouds light up. Okay? Now, does that happen only at night? It happens so much of the time during any thunderstorm. Well, the picture, I think, is this, and we'll see, this represents something profound. And the cloud, and inside the cloud is this fire that becomes clear at night. So clear, in Exodus 13, that if God so told them, they could travel by night by the light of this cloud. Now, it was the most dominating thing to see. If okay, I'm a stranger walking along and all of a sudden I see this big camp of people, right? I might be shocked by all the people, but you know what's going to really shock me? The, right in the middle of this, this, this group of people with all their tents is this cloud, this hanging there. And if I happen to go by at night, what do you see? You see this inside this cloud, this blaze. Now, all of this principally has this in mind. This is point five, point five. It was the revealed and concealed glory of God. I've got a, here's from Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 through 38. 
This is a description of what takes place the moment Moses finishes erecting the temple. I mean, the tabernacle. It says, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. Pause for a moment. Why is it called the tent of meeting? Who? What? Yes. This was a place for God to meet with his people. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, wherever whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would see it, would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel through all their journeys. That was, that was just there. Now, what in the world do I mean by it was, <clears throat> it was the revealed and concealed glory of God? The cloud was the visible an active expression of the presence of God in the midst of and for the benefit of God's people. It was a declaration, a public proclamation of God's visible and active care for His people. God, in a sense, was publicly present with His people. He was in some way seen for all the people to behold. Not, you know, you think if you're one of the priests, how many times does the priest get to see the dwelling glory of God? Once a year. When he goes into the, the Holy of Holies with blood, goes behind the curtain and there dwells at the footstool of God, the throne of God, between the cherubims, the glory of God. That was it. But you realize something? Every single child of God would wake up in the morning and see the cloud, which was in some sense the revealing of the glory of God. The glory of God wasn't just for the priests on this day of atonement, but it was for the glory of God revealed was for all the people every day, day and night. You know, could, could God get more conspicuous? I think sometimes we look at this cloud and we go, oh, isn't that quaint? It's more than quaint. It was to be a soul-shaking reality every single day of their life and every single night. They couldn't get away. I mean, you get up in the middle of the night and you had to go to the restroom. Guess what? It was so bright, if he needed to, the whole, people, the whole camp could travel. God was demonstrating in the most profound way His presence and His activity for the benefit of His people. The cloud revealed something of the presence of God. It revealed His presence, that He is with Him, His power, His awesomeness, His majesty. I mean, here's this cloud. Everybody knows clouds. And you know, when I was a kid, I'd lay in my backyard, I'd look up, and you know the neat thing about clouds? You, do you ever do that and see how they make shapes and stuff? And you know, that's a, that's a rhinoceros, and over here is, you know, a, a watermelon, or over here, it, you know, I just, I, mean, I come up with real strange things. But you know what you see? You'd see the wind blowing the clouds right along. They just disappear out of sight. This cloud didn't blow with the wind. There could be a gale force wind, and it wasn't moving. It was demonstrating to the people that God was in their midst, that he was powerful in their behalf. And there was a majesty and a glory and, a, and an awesomeness about him that they were to live under. But this cloud not only revealed, but also concealed what was inside the cloud. You couldn't see, could you? You could not see what was inside the cloud, but you got a sense of what's inside the cloud at night. What did you see? You see fire. This cloud, in some measure, revealed something about God to his people. At the same time said, folks, 
you have to understand something. You can't look at me in my face. In Exodus 33, Moses is discouraged after the people of Israel commit the great sin of the golden calf. And for encouragement, he says, God, I want to see your glory. And God says, Moses, no one can see my face and live. And what he means by that is no one can see the absolute total essence of who I am and survive. But what I will do is I'll chuck in a little rock here and I'll walk by and you'll see the glory, the, la the, the hinder part of my glory. I will conceal the full blunt brunt of my glory from you because it would, be, it would annihilate you. And this cloud gives us the reality that there is a glory of God revealed and a glory of God concealed because you know what? In our present state, could we look at the glory of God? No. And so the children of Israel were reminded of this glory of God being in their presence and for their provision, both the fact that God was seen and also the fact that in measure God was concealed and held back. You cannot see God and live. Brings us to the second question. What was the purpose of the cloud? The first thing I think it demarked these people as belonging to God and under his protection and care. It was a stamp. They are mine. And they're under my protection. And I'm watching over them. And I'm guiding them. And to all people, beware. Keep your hands off. Because to deal with them, you'll deal with me. It was a profound demonstration that God was saying to these people, these are my people and I am their God. And it was done in a very concrete and obvious way. So much so that, as it says here, it was obvious to all, to the people themselves. Because every morning they get out and they say, hey, what's that there? That's a reminder to me. That this is my God and I'm his people to the strangers that walked by and to the enemies that they would encounter. Can you imagine being a, uh, one, of the, one of the enemies and say, we're going to wipe these whole people out. And you get there and you're right on the edge of the camp and all of a sudden you see this and you go, I wonder what that is. I mean, kind of be puzzling, wouldn't it? It's a cloud, but it's not moving. Well, we'll attack at night. So you wait, gets dark. And you see, you, and I, my, my take is it's not, here's this cloud and it's not just a a fire, I mean, it's not just a light that's there. It's, you know, have you ever watched a fire in a fireplace? What, it undulates, right? And I, I see this, 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 this moving fire inside of this cloud obscured, and I would think that enemies would think twice about attacking because God was demonstrating to them, to all people, that this, these people were his people and belonged to him. They certainly would be startled by its size, but man, the shocking reality of this cloud. Thirdly, and, and it's clear in this text, its stated purpose was to direct and guide the people in their journey to the promised land. It was clear. You can read it here. You can read it at the, the end of Exodus. Almost every time that it talks about the cloud uh, by day and the, and the fire in it by night, it's always talking about God directing the people. He directs them when to depart, night or day, where to make camp, how long to stay. There's a suggestion in the reading here that perhaps on one occasion they were there one day. Now God didn't tell anybody ahead of time, we're only going to be here one day. So can you imagine you are the Kohathites, you are the Merites, you are all the priests, and so God, the, 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 the cloud comes down and you, put, and, you, and you put together the tabernacle. Put it all together. How long would it take? It takes some work, wouldn't it? And all the other tribes in the right places are assembling their tents. And just when you get done, God says, it's time to leave. Do you think that happened? It's that, that text suggests that. It says sometimes two days, sometimes a month. Wow. You go, what are you doing, God? We just sat up, right? We just finished this. God didn't say, well, if it, is it all right if we move? Did he? 
You know what it's saying? This is so important. It is declaring who's in charge. Now at the heart of this is the fact that they're being guided by the glory of God manifested. What was it that was guiding them throughout this wilderness wandering was the glory of God seen. God put himself on public display for these people to demonstrate who he was in their behalf. It was all according to the Lord's timing and purpose. It wasn't theirs. It wasn't say, well, God, I, I really don't want to go. And you know what? How often of us we get distra distraught and, and, and irritated by God changing our timetables. You know, we want God to do things when? <laughs> when we want them. And we want to go where we want to go. And we want to do what we want to do, right? Now, do you think we're unique? You, I'm sure they, I could imagine, because the, they were grumblers, right? I can imagine the, the first time where they get all done and says, we can take it easy. And all of a sudden they look and here's the cloud goes, whoop. And that was the indication of what? Yeah. It's time to go. Oh. And I can, <laughs> right? And how are we much different? Grumbling and complaining. Well, God, you know, it, it, it's really interesting. God doesn't care. Now, I don't know if you noticed, there was a statement, a phrase that occurred seven times in this passage in reading. Did, you, did any, of it, any of you notice what that, pass, that, that phrase was? It occurs seven times. At the command of the Lord. And then two times he adds the charge of the Lord. So nine times it is telling us that this rising of the, uh, of the cloud and the leading was the way in which God commanded his people. Now, we've got to get used to something, and this is really important. I cannot find a place in the Bible where God says, would you please do this? Can you? Why? What does God do? He commands. He says, you do this. This is my order. This is is my law. This is my statute. This is what I'm telling you to do. And seven times it says, at the Lord's command. This was the command of the Lord. Now, I think it reiterates that because essentially from the fall on whose commands do we want to operate? Our own. Isn't it? I mean, just look at, just, just think about yesterday and the choices and the directions and the things you did. How much of yesterday did you live conscious of God's lordship over all aspects of life? Isn't it so easy to go through life oblivious to the true sovereign of our life? I don't know about you, it is for me get so busy and so in, 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 enraptured in things that I'm just doing this, I'm doing that, and I become so forgetful. Not that I want to, but it just it seems just like kind of the natural thing, doesn't it? Well, it isn't. God is in charge. And one of the things I, I'm trying so desperately to process is that when God changes what I plan, it's profoundly right. Instead of grumbling and complaining and bickering and, and kind of behind my breath accusing God of something to say, God, I love what Mary said. Angel came to her and says, you're going to be uh, born of a child. You're going, to, you're, going to be, you're going to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And then what does she say? Remember what she says? According to your word, Lord, let it be done unto your servant. I mean, and you know what? I mean, she, just think of what she was embracing. She was embracing a pregnancy before marriage and all the shame that people would heap upon her, right? She says, Lord, whatever you want. Whatever you want, Lord. And essentially, that's it. But the thing is, what commanded them wasn't that God uttered a word. 
God directed them from this, his glory, manifest and obvious. He directed and governed them by his glory. God is very, very conspicuous about his glory. The last question, what are we to take away from this text? Four points. Now you say, I only see three. That's all right, it's on the next one. Okay, I've got it on the next one. What, what does this mean for us? Now obviously, the subtitle of this, you know, Numbers, the presence of God through the wilderness wanderings. Uh, do you remember, what's, what is the, the Hebrew name for the word for the book of Numbers? You know what it is? Remember that? It's wilderness. It's wilderness. The whole book of Numbers is about the wilderness wanderings. Now, they're just wandering around and just bumping and not having any idea where they're going. What, what, what's the truth? What is God's intention for the children of Israel as they leave Sinai? Where are they to go? They're to go to the promised land. And in fact, they've, the, last week we, we looked at they celebrated in the first month, the 14th day, the, the Passover. That was the second. The first was in Egypt. The second was at Mount Sinai. You know when the third is, was supposed to be? In the land. Well, 38 years later they do it. But they, they were supposed to be going someplace. They were to be going through the wilderness home. And this journey home to the, through the wilderness was accompanied by what? By his presence, right? What I see here is that God has publicly committed himself to personally guide his people safely home. Now, that, I don't know about you, but that's important for me to process life. Because I have no idea what tomorrow holds. And life becomes so confusing and so topsy-turvy and so at times heartbreaking, right? There are people who attack. There are people who criticize. There's all sorts of things that lie in this wilderness. But understand this. If you are a child of God, you're not alone. The song, we, we, we several people brought up, <clears throat> the charge for his children he lays upon himself. And this, this cloud for the Israelites was saying, I am personally committed for you to get safely home. Now, for the Israelites, it was the promised land. Now, you know what the promised land is? Another name for the promised land, what God says of it? It's my land. And what it meant was when they came to the promised land, the essence is you're coming home. You're coming closer to me. Now for us, the wilderness is between today and when we come home to the Father. And it's not like you're on your own. It's not like you're just to, to stumble through the wilderness. It's not like you're, 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 you're to just hope and pray and, and just kind of slug your way through so that you get home. God says, I am there to guide you. Because, understand this, if you're his people, God looks at you and say, he says, I want you. God doesn't need you, but God wants you. And I don't want a God that needs me because there's not much here. But the thought of God wanting me, wow. And God says, I am personally committed to bringing these people home. Second point, the inescapable and controlling reality that life must be about the glory of God. The inescapable and controlling reality of life must be the glory of God. When God was in the Israelites, the thing that he wanted to burn into their minds day and night, seven days a week, was his glorious presence amongst them, right? And, and, and mind you, this is a sidebar. That is what makes all of their transgressions and all of their failures so horrendous. They saw it all. They experienced it day and night. They ate of God's blessing and they drank of God's blessing and they saw the presence of God revealed 
and yet they sinned. That is what what demarks and that's what makes their sin so heinous. We'll get into that. But it you couldn't escape it. You could not escape the reality of the glory of God, and, and, and we must not. What defines and centers and locks your life and mine, if we are a believer, is the very glory of God. Of God. Third point, this glory led and directed life is, it was for them not some option, was it? It wasn't optional. God, did, God doesn't say, well, I'm going to present to you um, what I'd like you to do. And would you please sign off on it? But if you don't want to do it, I understand. That's okay. Maybe I can come up with an alternative plan. Is that how God operates? No, no, he does not. He doesn't say, well, this is optional. This glory-led and directed life is not some option that we can take or leave. It is the command of God for our lives. Careful, attentive obedience to this directing of God is paramount. One of the things that is frightening is how comfortable Christians are becoming with disobedience. How? It's no big deal. We had a, you know, there's a song. We, in college, we messed up. It, we did this, all sorts of bad things. And the song was this. We messed up. Free from the law, happy condition. Sin all you want with easy remission. And you know, there's an attitude of that. At the end of Romans chapter 5, it says, where, grace abound, or where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And then Paul's comment in chapter 6, verse 1 says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What? God forbid. We are to live lives of careful and attentive obedience to the directing of God by his glory and praise. The last of these, the cloud revealed something about God and concealed other things. But Jesus Christ is the complete and perfect revelation of the glory of God. In John chapter 1 verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh and dwell among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. And I think this is the, this is the two things that, that stellarly burn from Christ, full of what? Two things. Grace and truth. The cloud revealed and the cloud concealed, but Jesus reveals. One of the most mind-numbing verses in Colossians. It says, In Him dwells all the fullness of Godhead bodily. Jesus Christ is the complete and perfect revelation of God because He is God. But He is God in the flesh. And it's mind-boggling. And this is, this is the thing that we understand. If, if it, this, this cloud was a foreshadowing of Christ. And now, how many times do we find in, in direct language or in figurative language the command for all of us to set our eyes and to affix the, the, the affections of our heart upon Jesus Christ? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Again and again and again you see this, this focus. And the picture is this. In the Old Testament, the, the people of Israel, they were led, they followed, they were supposed to follow the, 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 the cloud, the expression of God's glory day in and day out. There was a lot revealed about God, but there was so much concealed about God. That cloud, in a sense, is gone. It is not obscurity when we look into the face of Jesus Christ. You know that? When you look into the face of Jesus Christ, it's not God obscured, but it's God revealed. And the whole of your life and mind is to be governed and controlled by beholding that glory and following it. The, the children of Israel were governed, controlled, identified, located by the glory of God 
And that was God's intention. He said the very thing. They were led by and for the glory of God. Their lives would be, were to be a, a constant daily demonstration of the, of the worth and the glory of God and how they carried out and executed every aspect of life as they were passing through this life. Do you realize something? Why does James says friendship the world is what? You know what friendship the world is and why he calls it enmity with God? You know what, huh? It's hatred, but you know what, you know what it means? If I'm, if I'm friendly with this world, you know what I'm telling everybody? This is my home. This is where I belong. I prefer this to God. And that's why it's enmity, it's hostility. Whenever we lock ourselves into this world, wherever we hold on to things too tightly to the stuff of this world, we are declaring to everyone, we don't care. But when we are led by and governed and controlled and directed by the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, we declare to the world, we're strangers and pilgrims. We're showing to everyone that our politics isn't here, but in heaven. That's what Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven. He uses the word politics. He says, our politics is in heaven. That's where we're going. And that's who we're following. And that's our lives. As we travel, who knows what lies ahead? Consider these four points. that God has publicly and personally committed himself to guide you home to himself. Secondly, realize the inescapable and controlling reality of life, of life must be lived by the, in the glory of God. Thirdly, the glory-led and directed life is not something optional that we can take or leave. But lastly, and most importantly, Jesus Christ is the full revelation of God. Everything about him. It says in John 1.18, No man has seen God any time, but the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he's made him known. And what a privilege we had that they didn't. So, oh, I, want, I, I wish we could see a cloud. That's what, you know, that's how we, I wish I could see that cloud. I wish I could see those miracles. And, and it's, it's hogwash to that. You have God in the flesh revealed to you through the Spirit of God. So your life and mine is a wilderness wandering. And as we will see very shortly, chapter 10, they leave. Chapter 11, it gets ugly. So we'll see that as we come. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this, your word and the promises and the provisions that you give us. But Lord, let us take seriously what you command, how you led them and how you lead us by the glory of your Son. Please work your word into our hearts and lives now. In Jesus' name, amen.